Hello and welcome to the BDMS Wellness Clinic. I'm Dieter Burkhardt and it is my privilege to bring today a special clip we're calling Ask the Expert. Today I'm joined by a world-renowned neurosurgeon and professor and chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, Professor Keith Black. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Dieter. Well, today we're going to be talking about neurodegenerative diseases. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is and who is at risk? So neurodegenerative disorders is essentially a disease of aging. As we age, our brain cells begin to sort of die, uh, the connectivity begins to deteriorate, and we get disorders associated with that aging and brain cell death um, that fall into categories like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, which mm. is a subtype of dementia, Parkinson's disease, and other types of neurological disorders. And are there people that are more at risk for developing these disorders than others? So we know that there are, are genetic components to Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, for uh, some patients that have a very strong genetic predisposition, uh, we will sometimes see the disease manifest at an early age, in the, in the decades, in the 40s, and in the 50s. For most of these disorders, which can still have a genetic component, uh, and it's the most common type, we see the disease manifest much later, mm -hmm. in our late 60s, 70s, and 80s. How, how common is it now? So uh, it is essentially a, a disorder of aging. So the older the population becomes, mm -hmm. the more common these disorders become. Alzheimer's uh, will affect about one in eight individuals that are 65 years or older. By the time you look at an age group that is 85 years or older, about 47% of that population will have Alzheimer's or some type of dementia. Now, dementia is essentially a disorder that affects our memory, our judgment, our cognitive ability. Alzheimer's is the most common type, and it accounts for about 70% of all dementias. There are different types. You can also get, for example, a vascular dementia, which is related to little small strokes that may be too small for the patient to actually notice. You can even have a dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, but there are different types. But Alzheimer's is the one that we normally think about and is certainly the most common. Now, as we know, there is currently no cure for Alzheimer's. If someone were at higher risk of developing it, what would you say to someone that might be afraid of getting tested? Well, uh, because there's no magic bullet, there's no magic pill that we can take to actually stop the pathological progression of the disease, it doesn't mean that we cannot affect the course of the disease over time. There are a couple of important things to really understand about Alzheimer's disease. One is that it's very similar to disorders like diabetes or high blood pressure. It has this long, silent phase that can actually pre-exist for decades before a patient becomes symptomatic. So if one was to actually to begin to develop memory loss in their mid-70s or 80s, the disease actually starts about two decades before those symptoms occur. Uh, it begins with uh, brain cell loss, loss of connectivity within the brain cells. This is a quiet phase. And that's the phase where we have the greatest opportunity to intervene. Because if we can slow that progression, and extend the symptomatic phase out another 10 or 20 years and extend the development of symptoms in the mid-70s or 80s until someone is in the mid-90s or 100, we essentially have an opportunity to cure the disorder in most people's lifetime. We know that uh, lifestyle um, can have a huge impact on the progression of the disease, very similar to the, the impact of lifestyle on disorders like diabetes and high blood pressure. So things like diet mm -hmm. uh, has been shown in more and more scientific studies to have an impact on the progression of the disease, particularly in this quiet phase, early phase. Uh, exercise uh, has been shown to be extremely important. Uh, sleep, uh, moderating our stress, things like micronutrients, supplements that we can take, mm -hmm. Uh, can have an impact on the overall course. Uh, just to show you the, the impact of this survival, there was one very good study uh, just looking at women, mm -hmm. two groups of women, and one group of women were exercisers, and the other group of women were not, and they were essentially matched uh, to each other. 
the group that exercised had a 10-year delayed onset of dementia compared to the group that did not exercise. So imagine if I had a pill that I told you you could take that would delay the onset of dementia by 10 years, you would consider that to be a home run. So the impact of these lifestyle influences are not small. They're potentially quite significant. And as we learn more about the impact of lifestyle, the ability to combine and optimize lifestyle, optimizing diet, optimizing exercise, optimizing sleep, uh, ability to moderate stress, uh, keeping the brain active and engaged, uh, I think the impact that we can have just with these modifications can be quite significant. I think um, it's, it's very encouraging to know that, like any other disease, if we can identify it early, we can start making moves to try to prevent it from happening, or at least happening as severe as it might do otherwise. So thank you very much for this information. And thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you again for our next round of Ask the Experts.